So, go ahead and uh, just introduce yourself and tell us about your uh, dog life journey. Yeah, my name is Jennifer Isch. I'm 41 years old and we are located in Germany. I'm married and my husband and I are a typical dog sports couple because we met on a training field. He was judging the very first trial I ever did with the Golden Red Reaver back then. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, we've been in con contact after that and um, yeah, got together and been together for almost 19 years now. Oh, awesome. And we are both um, training directors of two clubs. We were switching positions in one club. Um, Matthias is the president and I'm the training director. And then the other club, I am the president and he's the training director. But oh. the members of both clubs are more or less the same. So it's just the, the name. Right. Actually, it's not more people. It's just different names for the same stuff. <laughs> right. Um, we are both active members in the PSK, in the German Breed Club for Giant Schnauzers. Mm -hmm. Um, Matthias was um, very active in um, what is called dog sports politics. He's um, the president of the regional club we are located in and was on the um, federal board for, um, I think, 17 years and retired from that a couple of years ago. And now we're just local dog sports people okay. trying to get as much as fun as possible out of our hobby. Right. Absolutely. Yep. <clears throat> and yeah. do you uh, train other people's dogs as well? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, we not not in the in the sense that we take their dogs and train them for them and return the dogs to the people uh -huh. just as in a in a club uh -huh. where you have a, a training field where you meet twice a week or uh -huh. three times a week to to train together and in, in those training fields, we are with a couple of other people, the training directors. And Matthias is a decoy for the protection part, as well as an um, Schutzhund and judge. Mm -hmm. So he, we travel a lot and meet a lot of people. We've been to the United States a number of times when Matthias got invited. Um, he judged one of those big... Um, competitions, the AWDF championships a couple of years back in obedience. Mm -hmm. So we met a lot of people from all over the world and it's just a really small world in dog sports. Why did uh, why did you guys choose or why did you choose the, the giant schnauzer? Originally I wanted a Rottweiler uh -huh. and my parents were really against it and they wanted a boxer and i did not want a boxer we i grew up with boxers we had boxers when i was younger but i um were not my favorite type of dog uh -huh. and so we came up with a compromise and ended up with a golden retriever <laughs> <laughs> instead of the rock <laughs> and the condition for me to to have this dog for my 18th birthday was that i go with the dog to the training fields because I was young and didn't know anything about training dogs and, and um, educating dogs so that was the condition and I went to the local um, PSK club in Cologne where I lived when I was younger and started training my golden retriever in this PSK club and then for the first time I actually met a giant schnauzer and I was fascinated from from the start and it was perfectly clear after a couple of years that my next dog would for sure be a working giant because they are just awesome. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I got my first own giant um, a while back and um, she died recently this last Christmas with 14 over 14 years and she got really old and kept me company for a long long time and um, I currently have a two-year-old giant schnauzer female that is mine but we have two dogs and uh, Matthias has a male that's eight years old and still is in training 
and in competition. Wow. Yeah. And what are the, some of the specifics about the giant schnauzer that really that that made you fall in love with it? There's there are dogs with with multiple personalities. Mm -hmm. They have this really intense athletic ability to move and and to express themselves. And when working in protection, they they really have a presence. Mm -hmm. But this is to the outside world, and if you have them in private, if they check their collars at the door and they're just themselves within the families, they're just completely different, different people with with their family and friends. They're just goofy, really, really stupid acting dogs. <laughs> And um, they, they just have those two sides. They're just really, really perfect family dogs, and they are just those those really impressive, aggressive, um, appearing dogs in when it comes to working outside or when it comes to protecting what they deem worthy to protect. And what what are some of the good qualities about them as far as the protection work is concerned? Are are they? Um... You know, like compared to, you know, a, a Rottweiler or Doberman Pinscher? We, we have the saying in our, in, our, in our group, a good dog doesn't have a color. Mm -hmm. You have, in, in almost every working breed, you, you look for the same type of dog. You, you need the same qualities mm -hmm. when it comes to, to prey drive and when it comes to, to the ability to concentrate and when it comes to to courage and um, yeah it's it's a bit of toughness you have to against yourself when you go into um, it, it's a fight when when a, a dog and a human being collide then it's 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 a fight to for dominance and um, who, who is going to win it's just like um, amateur boxing or MMA or yeah. something like that mm -hmm. just with the <laughs> Um, just with the difference that for most dogs, um, the attitude changes as soon as they leave the training field. Right. Those. So it's just a sports mm -hmm. variety of that. Because in Germany, we have um, the problem that we are not allowed to work the dog civil, in a civil way. That means um, like police officers or... Um, military personnel trains their dogs. That is um, illegal in Germany and in many other European countries as well. Right. So it's just a regular sports version, a, a reduced version of that, what what um, canine dogs in, in, um, in the military or in the police do, but it does select for the same qualities they need. Mm -hmm. And since it is uh, working breed um they they are selected for that quality to serve in in military and, and police forces <sighs> i grew up um on horseback and, and in a horseback community and when i i got older um uh due to um medical reasons i couldn't continue going riding and i went um i did eventing and that's really an adrenaline paced horse sport variety. Mm -hmm. And um, I was, when I started out with my golden retriever, it was just for general education. Mm -hmm. And then you grew into this community and it is in, in good clubs, it's just a group of, of friends meeting twice a week to train. It's like any other sports where you have a group sport. It, on the field, in, in trials or in competitions, you only see one person and one dog, but in reality, there are at least 10 people behind that one person on the field that made it happen that they could compete at that level. Right. And if, if the team is good, it's just such an awesome way to spend your time. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I think that is what, what caught me. Um, Along with working with a dog or working with an animal, achieving communication where actually no communication is possible, 
because we speak two different languages. Mm -hmm. And that is really the fun part, finding a way to communicate and get your point across without handing over the rules in writing. <clears throat> Who would you say are some of your mentors uh, in the dog life uh, world? What and, and how come they were mentors? Oh, my, my first mentor is probably the training director of the local club I went to as a teenager with my golden retriever because she set me on, on the right path and and showed me how to enter all this, this brand new world mm -hmm. and, and how to navigate. And all a lot of stuff we do today are, are still something similar to, to a lot of ideas she had back then mm -hmm. so um she had a, a big influence um she's an ipo judge in, in the psk um she got that um five years ago and she's she's a really awesome person and when i met matthias and moved to um to bochum that's um for us ideas it's just around the corner for us it's really far away it's an hour away yeah 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 <laughs> um so um i i switched to matthias club and um been a member of this club here ever since and having your partner with the same hobby is really uh, a benefit because you don't have to argue about the time you spend doing what you love to do because you do it together and um, that really helped a lot too. And since we both are in the same variety of dog sports, so we both do protection and obedience training, um, it is just a lot of fun to do. And we, particip we participate in each other's training a lot, even though that is not always really easy to train with your spouse. <laughs> Yeah. That can be kind of challenging. Yeah. Um, yeah. But we always manage to leave whatever argument we have on the training field and return home <laughs> without it. <Huh. laughs> At least we, we try and, and we manage a lot of the times. Mm -hmm. um, but we also went to to quite a few um, seminars and just to to look how other people solve problems. And not to copy them but just to to broaden our horizon how you how different people try to solve the same problems and have a, a variety of tools if you maybe need a problem like that how what what possibilities you have to to solve it mm -hmm. and there's just no one rules fit all kind of tool it's just the person and the dog and um, the surrounding that um, depends or, or makes a solution possible or not. Right, absolutely. <clears throat> Can you uh, talk about the the history of the giant schnauzer and and what what breeds that were that it originally developed from, um, extinct or not? Um. It was actually a farm dog, mm -hmm. and it was the original breed. Is the um, there are three sizes: the miniatures, and the standard schnauzers, and the giant schnauzers. Mm -hmm. And the original version of the schnauzers and the pinchers was the standard size, the middle mm -hmm. sized. And from that on, um, the miniature sizes were bred, and the giants were bred. It is not completely clear what kind of dogs were crossed into this because it was a really farm-based dog breeding and so there is not something like oh they bred um, Great Danes or whatever into it. You can't tell because it was just a rural development. Mm -hmm. But the, the purpose they were bred for was first guarding um, activities around the farm. Mm -hmm around the area and for the people and um, the first were called rattlers they were used to hunt rats and 
whatever other unpermitted residents <laughs> were around right, right. the farms. And, and the very first ever competitions for schnauzers were actually cages with rats in them. They stopped the time the dark took to kill the rats. Right. Early in the 1900 and whatsoever. That was how they started out. And this is where um, a lot of the, the fight or, or the, the joy to fight comes from mm -hmm. our they schnauzers right. they just love confrontations because your regular rat doesn't die without a fight right. are worked they are used for police work um, they are used in the military um, we have some that are used in search and rescue teams mm -hmm. um, in our own club we um, have a dual sports um, ver versions. We have the IPO and protection sports group and we have a search and rescue group and a lot of our dogs are doing both. So um, we try to to have a very open mind to, um, to what you can do with your dogs and so um, for my young female we actually um, work in both. Right. We're trying for search and rescue as well as for the protection. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of lot of variety in the sports sites, and um, you see giants everywhere. You see them um, in um, police. You see them in regular, um, I don't know, security canine um, people have um, giant schnauzers. They aren't just that big a population that you see the numbers. Um, but, but they are still used and they are still bred for that purpose. There are actually quite a few in the United States that are in the police forces okay. um, all over the world. Okay. Yeah, I've just... Um, I just been that, that's due to the fact that, that most police departments um, search for, for a dog type and not for a breed type. Mm -hmm. They search for a dog that, that has to have certain, um, pr fulfill certain criteria, and they really don't care if it is a German Shepherd, a Belgian Malinois a Giant, or whatever, as long as the dog um, fits into their requirements, they really don't care. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And sometimes they are used because of their size, just as a, as a warning, because a Malinois, even though they cause the same damage they're just smaller dogs and they are light in color but a black giant schnauzer is just a more impressive image mm -hmm. um they're between 60 and 70 centimeters in height uh -huh. with the shoulder um in germany they are not allowed to have dog tails and cropped ears okay so they have to be natural um they should be square in size, not rect rectangle, but but really square. Mm -hmm. um, they have a harsh black or pepper and salt coat that can either be trimmed or clipped. That really depends on the person grooming the dog. Mm -hmm. Well, there are those, of course. It would be a lie if I would say that all giant schnauzers are um, working dogs. No, there are, there are two distinct line, bre lines of breeding, and that is the show or confirmation side of the breed, and this is the working side of the breed. Mm -hmm. And they mix, but not overly well. So when you see a working bred giant you see that it's bred a working breed giant just by looking at him because they are tend to be a lot lighter than the um, confirmation mm -hmm. types mm -hmm. just uh, just in build right. what are some of your favorite breeds besides the giant schnauzer i must admit i really really love bone retrievers still but they are so furry. 
yeah. But they're still, but they're so cute, and I will. If they wouldn't be coming with so much fur, we probably would have a golden retriever yeah. still. But yeah, okay. <sighs> yeah okay. I gotta admit that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I and I love cocker spaniels. Oh yeah, yeah. And I really yeah. get not for that too, but um, I really love, I really like those those faces. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I yeah. think they're cute. I'm a, I, you know, I, I'm, I like the short nosed dog. So I bought my wife a, a Shih Tzu five years ago, and she's be the love of my life now. So I like a little. Mm. I got I like little dogs too. So or non working style dogs. So yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so if you were. Uh, Strictly talking on a performance level here, uh, question. Uh, if you look into to my pages and the people I've interviewed and stuff, I really like um, uh, hybrids and uh, outcrosses and stuff like that to, to add life to certain breeds uh, like the Bulldogs. Um, so you don't have to answer this, uh, but... I know some people in Europe are uh, get touchy about this, but if you were going to outcross uh, with a giant Schnauzer uh, to for performance reasons, what breed would you use? If I wouldn't have to look at it, <laughs> ah, right? Just for performance reasons. <laughs> yes. Uh, that's hard. Hmm. That's hard because I really like don't like those schnoodles and whatever doodles they come up with. Uh, that is just a, a no go for me because that is just yeah. Mm-hmm. And we have we, I saw a couple of those dogs and they're just not what they are advertised for. But anyways, um, performance wise, I probably would pick. It, it needs to be a dog that has those two sides as well. Mm-hmm. Those um, outward warrior side and the softy side for the family. Mm-hmm. Uh, probably, uh, yeah, probably Rottweilers. Mm-hmm. Because they have that as well. Yeah, definitely. I just, yeah. I, that was one of the two breeds that I was thinking. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the other one would have been adult terriers because they have that as well but they are so stubborn if they don't want to do something are they? Yeah. and th- that combined with with that much attitude you have from from a really well-bred giant you know, so that's not a good combination right right so performance wise i would probably pick a uh, Pick a good working Rottweiler and a giant Schnauzer. Awesome. But I really would not think they would look so pretty. Yeah. Probably not. Probably I mean, not. imagine a fuzzy haired Rottweiler. That would look. Hmm. It might, might look big and hmm. mean and scary. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Hopefully somebody more will like try. the drummer from the Muppet Show, yeah. like Beast from the Muppet Show. <laughs> there you go. There you go. That's funny. So, can you talk about kind of your uh, morning and evening routines with your dogs? What is there anything special that you do, or? Mm, no, not really. Yeah. I mean, we have them in our house. We we get up. We take them for the walk for a walk. Um. We walk them for a short time in the morning and do the the big walks when we return home mm-hmm. afternoon. Mm-hmm. And no, they they go for a walk. They get their breakfast and then they go back to sleep. <laughs> and they're really <laughs> and they're really not amused when we delay departing because they want to take their morning nap. Right. Right. <laughs> So can you yeah. talk about you guys? Uh, what kind of diet do you feed your dogs? Because I know this is a huge, uh, even in the sport and breeding world, it's a, there's various answers. 
yeah, there are various answers, and where we actually feed regular dry food, uh -huh. um, just because our dogs function good with it, they they have no issues when it comes to their health. Mm -hmm. They just like their food; mm -hmm. they're just not picky. Um, we tend to stick with the same brand mm -hmm. um, for as long as it works out for the dog because we have the impression as that if you switch too often you just challenge health issues mm -hmm. for for developing allergies against certain ingredients and stuff so if they they get along with one type of food we we tend to stick um to that but they get i mean yes they they are garbage cans i mean they they eat everything yeah, I bet. <laughs> whatever Whatever there that is eatable, they they eat it, and um, you cannot eat an apple or a banana or whatever fruit or vegetable in this household without um, sharing with the black crew. So you you just have to share. Yeah, yeah. So cooking is always kind of an adventure because they they tend to um, insist on their share. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, they, they, they are not allowed to back at, at the table, but um, while cooking, if you peel apples, um, you have to eat, they have to each get a slice of apple or something. As a, so they they just not, usually giants are not picky eaters. Right. They just take whatever they get. They are not as bad as um, Labrador's, definitely right. not. They are just the Champions League of garbage can eaters <laughs> those slabs I mean <laughs> they're just diminishing food but um, yeah giants just are happy for whatever they they can back out of your pocket right can you talk about some of the the health issues that, that the giant schnauzer may have that people need to be aware of that before they buy one mm. That actually depends a bit on um, the the country you get them from. I have really not that big of an information for um, dogs that are bred in the United States. I can only speak for the um, dogs that are bred in Germany. Mm -hmm. um, that there tend to be difference because the breeding regulations are different. Um, in Germany, you have to have the hips x-rayed before the dogs are entered into the breeding program. Mm -hmm. And it is a fair bit stricter than um, in, in some of the um, AKC registered clubs. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes they, they don't have a minimum requirement. It's just something they do as an advertisement feature, but not... Um, as, as a breeding requirement, but I I really don't know the exact requirements in, in other countries. For for a German bred giant schnauzers, you have um, to x-ray the hips mm -hmm. to see, um, as in any big breed, if, if the hips are okay. Um, and they are discussing um, if they should be... Um, controlled with the eyes if there are eye issues that needs need to be monitored but um right now the numbers that are known are so low that it is really um yeah it is at the point if if you um screen for it you admit that at the end that there might be a problem if and then you screen for for eye issues and after t five years you find out oh, you don't have any eye issues but because you screen for it um you have this this marker on the read that um all giant schnauzers have eye issues mm -hmm. so this is kind of a, a balance to keep um they like any breed they're, they're, and there is no distinct um illness like with with the merle factor breed that you have blue eyes and um 
and um, the moral color um, combined with um, that they can't hear or something like that. We don't have issues like that in our breeds. Mm -hmm. So, um, generally, they are really healthy. I mean, we we personally had four giants since we met, and they all exceeded ten years. Um, the the male we had before the current one was twelve. My female was fourteen. The one before that was ten. So they all ours at least tended tended to to get really old for for such a big dog. That's um that's okay. And the the boy. And the, the uh, male we currently have, he's eight years old, and he's still <laughs> competing. And uh, Matthias will try out for for the German Championship again this year. So it's just still high level performance, mm -hmm. and he's already eight years old. Mm -hmm. I mean, you you have never have an an insurance when you buy a puppy that it will grow up healthy mm -hmm. and no matter how much precaution the breeder put into the breeding you can always end up with the wrong model yeah. there is there's actually there's absolutely no way you can ensure a, that the puppy will become the perfect healthy dog even though um, the breeder did everything to to make it happen so this is there is a rest of biology still left in breeding and i'm i'm really it is always sad for the people that have those dogs and i'm not i'm um, talking down on the problems they they really have if you um have a puppy that has epilepsy for example no matter what breed it's just a horrible thing mm -hmm. um but it's nothing um that is in for for our lines that is nothing that is present but it, there is always this distinct variables in all breeds that that something like this this c could happen there is, there is just no no way to exclude this yeah yeah we we are having this discussion right now in germany and i i think it this is a, it's a really hard discussion because there is no right no, you're right. There, there is a truth, truth to both to to both arguments, uh -huh. um, and I think the middle way is um, is for me it is the right way. If you have an indication that in your line there might be a problem with whatever issue you might have, heart disease or or eye issues or whatever, then I would test my dog for that specific health issue. But if I have no indication because there was never any relative of that dog that had any issues with the eyes, no matter where you look, why would I even come to the idea to test for eye issues? Mm -hmm. no. uh, mm -hmm. Yeah? I agree. <clears throat> I mean, I, that, that is just like... I, I'm... I'm not against testing health issues, but um, I don't need to to make the veterinarians richer than they already get by me coming by. Right. Yeah. But this is a really delicate issue, and there are um, DNA tests for some um, health issues, but the problem with DNA testing is that they are not solid. They they develop. And that the the um, statement they have today when they test for a certain um, DNA issue is a completely different than the same tests five years ago. Yeah. The results with the same DNA sample is a complete different one in, in many, many of those tests. And until that is fixed, that they know what they are really testing for and that they know that they test for the right thing, um, I, I distrust those DNA tests. Yeah, and I totally can understand people with affected dogs um, that 
that is not a fun thing to have. Mm -hmm. I seriously, I can understand that. I experienced an epileptic um, a seizure with with a dog with a um, Pomeranian when I was visiting in the United States, and that is just awful. That is really, really awful. But it is if if there are very very few numbers affected that is just the regular way biology works mm -hmm. sometimes dna screws up and it doesn't fit that doesn't mean that the whole breed is affected right because there are every now and then there is a dog that has this specific health issue um the the problem is to find the marker where the whole breed is affected mm -hmm. And that is the, that is the danger that you miss the the the, the turning point where not only a, a number of dogs are affected, but it becomes a whole problem for the whole population. And I think that fear is what um, fuels this discussion with our, with our people right now. Is that they they are aware that there are only a very low percentage of affected dogs but they are scared of it spreading mm -hmm. and they i can understand that but i can understand the others that say we don't have an issue we never had an issue with ice don't make it an issue mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. but but i don't I, I mean dna would be the perfect medium because you wouldn't have to test for phenotype problem phenotypes for genotype problems but then you have to have reliable DNA tests. Mm -hmm. And um, if you look at the history of those DNA tests, even though those that are established, um, they change over time. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the big um, companies that do the testing, they even admitted that they tested for the wrong markers. Right. So you have a whole generation of dogs that are not allowed into the breeding program due to wrong indication of genetic markers mm -hmm. and that's my problem with DNA testing mm -hmm. I, I, I happily would test for whatever um, health issue they would come up with if they could guarantee me that um, they test for the correct markers but they can't do that mm -hmm. today I hope that that will change in the future because that would be perfect because then you have the, the clear distinction between a really affected dog and um, you can plan your breedings. Mm -hmm. If you're talking to a, uh, a, a, a working dog kind of guy and a protection sport guy, uh, just explain to you to that person why they should look at the giant schnauzer as maybe their next puppy. But that depends on what breed they are currently having. Um, we have uh, that is for Germany. That is for Germany. We have a lot of um, actually Malinois people um, trying out giant schnauzers or the other way around because both dogs have this um, athletic um, ability um, and the high prey and protection drives. Um, actually. You, you cannot um, convince those uh, people to, to buy a working giant schnauzer puppy by talking. They have to, to see them work mm -hmm. for themselves um, to, to, to experience what, what it looks like when um, a giant schnauzer works or what it looks like when whatever other working breed works. Um, I'm never a fan of um, of convincing other people of my breed because I'm I'm convinced that they do that for themselves mm -hmm. when competing. Mm -hmm. What are I'll, I'll I'll tweak the question a little bit. What are some of the qualities that you like about the giant schnauzer compared to some of the other breeds that you see on the field? Um. Athletics, mm -hmm. work ethics, um, the the young female I I train and 
far with. She's just a really, really happy worker. Mm -hmm. And she just, this, what what is actually a Golden Red Weaver quality, this will to please. Mm -hmm. She has more will to please than the Golden Red Weaver I owned ever had. Mm -hmm. Awesome. <laughs> um, and she... In, in the in the relationship with me and um, Matthias and, uh, and our family, she's just a really, really sweet, really, really nice and um, funny dog. Mm -hmm. And if a foreign person sees us goofing around and enters our, our area and says, oh, you're a cute little dog, she will turn from zero to 180 in just a snip and I said no that is my family and you don't belong and just go mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and she that that is and and she they transport that on the training field when they go um into the confrontation with the decoy mm -hmm. and they say stop here am i and you will not cross this bridge <laughs> Well, thank you very much for your time. It was great talking to you. and um, uh, Yeah, thank you. Yeah.